and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Lean Toss. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions to the panelists throughout the discussion. Afterwards, stay on to unwind and take a mental break with yoga instructor Emma Poole. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Forbes, Alex Knapp. Hello, good afternoon and everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, HLTH webinar on using artificial intelligence to fix broken math and optimize expensive health assets. Uh, I'm Alex Knapp. I'm a senior editor for healthcare at Forbes. I'm excited to be a part of this discussion today and uh, just want to start off by encouraging everyone out there uh, to also be a part of the discussion today by asking questions in the Q&A. We're going to be uh, talking through these things as we go along and, and uh, love for you out there to be a part of this discussion. And uh, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, start with uh, Mohan uh, Giridharadas, the founder and CEO of healthcare analytics company Lean Toss. And uh, let's, Mohan, when we talk about broken math and fixing with AI, what, what math is broken? And, uh, you know, what, what do we need to deal with in the healthcare system? Thanks, thanks, Alex. To talk about what math is broken, let's just think for a moment what it takes to schedule an appointment. You have to make the availability of the resource in question match the demand for that service or, or healthcare service. On the demand side, you've got to be able to predict how many patients, what type of patient, what kind of treatment they would need, how long it might take. On the supply side, you have to think about the staff, the equipment, the rooms, the drugs, whatever else is needed. Both sides of this equation are very hard. They're volatile, they're variable, it's difficult to predict. Now let's step back and think about how an appointment is made. Two people chat, they look at the calendar and they say, Bob, 10 o'clock on Wednesday. Nobody did any demand side math, nobody did any supply side math. This works if you're scheduling tennis courts. Uh, John, you get the eight to nine slot. Or if you're just scheduling conference rooms, this meeting is from eight to 10. It simply doesn't work for healthcare. And unfortunately, nothing in the EHR helps out because the fundamental premise in an EHR is scheduling is the reservation of a resource. So much like a tennis court or a conference room, when in fact it needs to have AI simulation, optimization, uh, et cetera, thrown in. So that's why we fundamentally believe that the math is broken. So uh, just to follow up a little bit here and, and maybe just to help make this more concrete for the folks out there, you know, what kind of assets uh, are we talking about that, that are seeing, you know, these kind of issues in, in terms of scheduling appointment, in terms of making sure people uh, maybe have access to them, um, not just when they're available, but also in a, in a timely fashion so that's helpful for Virtually every asset you can think of. So if you think about health systems, there are a series of services that are provided that require specialized assets, whether it's operating rooms, uh, inpatient beds, infusion chairs, imaging equipment, whatever equipment you need has to be utilized well. And it takes skilled staff to, to execute every one of these things. So we're talking about virtually everything in a health system. Great. So I, I want to uh, follow up on this idea with Dr. Robert Bart, who's a CAO of uh, Hospital Services Division um, at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, a man who hopefully knows that Sheets is better than Wawa. Uh, so Dr. Bart, I uh, want to uh, see if you can share some of your insights in, in terms of optimizing this sort of healthcare asset. I imagine during the pandemic, uh, this must have become a really, you know, serious uh, question. And want to know what kind of your experience in this was. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, so, you know, during the pandemic, allocation of resources and limited resources was something that was um, a challenge and an issue. Certainly, um, going back just under a year ago, uh, in Western Pennsylvania, we have had our our share of uh, COVID surges but certainly hasn't hit the critical nature as far as acute care that some other regions of the country have had. Um, our, our current challenge uh, as it relates to COVID and the pandemic response has really been in the vaccine administration space. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the state you live in, um, each state has been allowed to execute the lo logistics of distribution. 
unto itself. And, and Pennsylvania has really relied on healthcare systems for the community, community administration of vaccine. And so, you know, it's been a logistics issue of coordinating where we have vaccine available with identifying the currently the category 1A individuals who are eligible, trying to do that in a very um, ethnically and racially and socioeconomically equitable manner, which can sometimes be a challenge given the data sets that we have to work with, but making sure that you have resources to administer the vaccine and appropriate individuals to administer it to. And then the logistic of the vaccine and, and the storage requirements of it make, make it such that you really don't want to, you need to have a good match of the number of doses with the number of individuals, because it's a critical resource that you don't want to go to waste. And so coordinating all of those things has been, um, it's, it's been a bit of a challenge, but it's also been a, a, an interesting math problem, you know, as Mohan knows, to, to solve. It's, it's not one that we have applied ML and AI, it's been mostly um, elbow grease at this point because the dynamics related to understanding when we're going to get our next shipment and where those shipment of immunizations are going to be in the network that UPMC covers has been something that we're working through with the state. Um, but if it persists for a while, it is something that would be an amenable math problem for ML to be applied to. So I, I curious and, and want to follow up real quick is you mentioned, you know, making sure that you're matching doses to, uh, you know, enough people who are available uh, so that they don't go to waste. Um, how do you deal with issues of hesitancy in this regard where, you know, we, we know that there's X number of people in phase one who, you know, in this city, um, but then what happens if a third of them don't show up because they're, you know, if they don't want to do the vaccine or whatever, how, how do you handle that problem as well? So we, we've actually been, um, working with community leaders, um, mm -hmm. to, to do that, Alex. Um, I think that, uh, different, different, um, groups within our communities across the country ha do have hesitancy of related to some of it's related to trust, some of it's related to access to care. And what we've really tried to do is work with community leaders to help us get into those communities to understand the concerns and work with them directly. We mm -hmm. also know that um, there are some individuals that no matter what we do, they want to wait until they can get that appointment with the primary care physician they have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. And and right now, the um, logistic requirements of the current vaccines that are available with the exception of the Johnson & Johnson that was recently approved, are really only um, apply to, to mass vaccination events. Johnson mm -hmm. & Johnson, because of its storage requirements, is something that's conducive to office-based. But again, there's a limited supply. Um, and in the state of Pennsylvania, it's, usually, it's being used right now for a specific segment of the education population. Um, Got it. Thank you. And uh, I want to uh, then uh, tee off uh, our, our final member of the panel, uh, Rebecca Call. Uh, she is the VP and Chief Innovation Officer at the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And uh, Rebecca, I'd love if you could share with us uh, your own challenges during the pandemic and, and how, you know, uh, machine learning or AI, if you've been able to bring those to bear in, in solving some of these optimization issues. Yeah, so it actually, our challenges are a bit different because we're a standalone cancer center. So we're not in the position of um, widely distributing a vaccine, um, but we are in a position of having one of the largest immunocompromised populations in the world. Um, so it poses a very different challenge, which is how do we keep our patients safe, which means changing um, our whole way of caring for patients. Um, so supply and demand means something very different for us. It ends up having to do with a different type of care to provide in terms of demand and how we are going to supply that care. Um, and what I mean by that is more than half of our patients come from outside of Texas. Um, mm. so you can imagine COVID posed a very different challenge to us where um, it wasn't necessarily both desirable or safe um, for people to travel to come to be cared for in person, which launched a huge effort 
um, of standing up virtual care to the extent that we can. Now, of course, there are always parts of your cancer journey that you need to come and be treated, um, but it did change the way in which we looked at um, demand and supply. And when I say supply, that can mean a virtual visit, which means not utilizing necessarily a clinic room, um, but utilizing a computer, um, which changed what we had to distribute to our employees to deliver that care. It might mean using local resources. So starting to think about supply, not just in our Houston campus, but thinking about campuses across the world and how do we partner um, with local facilities as it might relate to diagnostics um, or basic care, um, where we do have a national network um, of partners to work with. Um, so before you could apply any kind of optimization to that, you actually have to find the new normal of how you're gonna deliver care and what constitutes demand and supply for what. Oh, that, that makes sense. And uh, so when you're trying to work with and solve these problems, you're trying to kind of uh, gin up uh, virtual, you know, healthcare system almost overnight, uh, it probably felt like. Um, do, do you, is this a thing that you were doing in house or are you working with, you know, partners uh, uh, to help kind of solve these problems? Um, largely in house, um, there are technological partners as it relates to virtual care, um, but not necessarily as it relates to how to employ these technologies, but largely, of course, you're you know, introducing telco technology into the equation, you're mm -hmm. introducing monitoring technology into the equation as well. Um, you're introducing engagement, digital engagement, omnimodal experience type capabilities so that you can introduce the ability to communicate via text, um, real time, you know, synchronous as opposed to, and also as asynchronous. So we introduced a lot of different technologies to support the new model, um, but it was largely an in-house effort to design that new model as to mm -hmm. how to utilize those capabilities to deliver a new model of care. Got it. Well, thank you. Well, uh, Mohan, I want to turn the floor back to you kind of after listening to uh, Rob and Rebecca talk about uh, some of the, the challenges here. Um, when What kind of uh, and what have you seen over the past year in working with your customers in terms of assisting in, in these kind of optimization issues, especially as it applies to whether it's vaccine distribution or standing up virtual care, things like that? Right. What we saw with COVID is it threw a huge shock on both the supply and the demand side of the equation. Initially, the supply shocks were shortage of PPE, shortage of ventilators, then move to shortage of ICU rooms, shortage of regular inpatient beds. Uh, and now potentially shortage of vaccines. So the supply shocks have been large and constantly moving. Similarly, the demand shocks as well. More patients are visiting a hospital than would normally have been projected. So in some things we can help, some things we can't. We don't have any clinical expertise, so we don't really uh, opine on that or try and help in any way on that. And as Rebecca said, some of the new models that are being created are best done by in-house teams because mm -hmm. they're the ones who best understand all the resources at their disposal and how they're gonna go do it. Where we can help is where we've got unique insight into, for instance, surgical backlogs, which uh, when as the COVID waves uh, were working their way through, many states canceled elective surgeries. Well, that creates a backlog and that backlog mm -hmm. has to be squeezed in because a knee that needs to be replaced still needs to be replaced at some point, even if you slide it out. So we were able to deploy our analytic tools in, in a very focused point-like manner uh, to help work through those. And uh, when you're helping with the kind of demand issues, I uh, wonder if you can walk me through a little bit, where, where uh, when you're solving these problems, uh, how does machine learning and AI help versus, you know, old fashioned elbow grease? Right. The amounts of data involved are quite large. So what we have to do is we have to mine the pattern of all the various types of appointments, segment them, classify them, uh, and not just look backwards because admiring the problem looking at yesterday's volumes is not that helpful. 
It's like looking at yesterday's newspaper for uh, stock market prices. You've got to be able to look into the future. So what we do with uh, with sophisticated algorithms is one predict with a very high degree of accuracy the volume and the mix and the type of patient, their propensity for running on time or running late for every time slice going into the future. So then you get a handle on the on the demand side. We then mine the patterns of staffing and rosters and layout to get a handle on the supply side. And from that, we can make intelligent recommendations. The objective is not to replace the person making the decision because they've obviously got the best judgment, but it's like providing an intelligent recommendation so that they can make smarter calls based on data rather than on gut feel. And then as life changes, these parameters change. So the models need to be retrained and they need to be evolving and continuous. And that's where just dumping an epic report and running an Excel spreadsheet simply doesn't do it. And um, when you're talking about training the, the machine learning models, uh, especially during a system shock, you know, like the pandemic, but of course, it might also be a natural disaster or, or, or something else. Um, how do you kind of validate your, your models so that you're more confident uh, that your algorithms, you know, are, are taking them into account efficiently? Well, the good part is the amount of data that's coming in every minute of every day is a lot. And mm -hmm. so you can train the models on a small subset of the data. It's called supervised machine learning and then apply it uh, to see what you predicted. And by the way, at the end of the day, you'll know what actually happened. And so you can start to see if your predictions are drifting away from what actually happened uh, and then correct accordingly. So we apply those kinds of methods on an ongoing basis. Terrific. And uh, so I want to move back to you, Rebecca, and I'm curious to know in terms of uh, optimizing assets, I imagine in a, in a cancer center, uh, whether during a pandemic or not, um, you're juggling a lot of things, especially if half your patient base lives out of state. So uh, are these type of machine learning models things that, that you're applying uh, it, at MD Anderson right now? We are. Um, we are. And so they can be very um, powerful instruments. And really, the challenge with it has to do really with the cleanliness of our data. Um, mm -hmm. So AI and ML is pretty much only as good as the data you have. So in conjunction with implementing these kinds of sophisticated technologies, we embark on a large data management um, exercise to make sure that our data um, is more structured, higher quality, more specific, um, more accurate, cleaner, um, so that we can get more out of these technologies. And where we've seen the most value and what I see kind of in the healthcare market, this does, isn't exclusive to MD Anderson, is there's a lot of low hanging fruit in your kind of operational use cases. So the kinds of things where we do kind of patient flow, um, you know, capacity management, the kinds of things that, you know, Lean Toss focuses on is of course, um, you know, you can get a very high value right away out of it. Um, in terms of thinking about how these technologies evolve um, and moving into kind of higher risk and um, you know, harder to quantify reward type mm. settings, which might be clinical interventions, um, we are starting to embark on that. So we've, had, we've started to invest in technologies to start to use predictive algorithms to predict um, risk levels of different populations of patients that guide different types of treatment. Um, that, that help us on, you know, identify those patients for different interventions. Um, and when I say interventions, that's the key to all of this. So the key when it comes to looking at AI or ML is actionability. Um, so a lot of people get caught up in this technology in terms of looking at accuracy and did it predict something accurately? And some of that becomes irrelevant if that level of accuracy doesn't allow you to intervene in a way that drives value. So when you get out of the operational domain, that's where it becomes tricky. If I can predict it, what am I going to do about it now that I know about it sooner? And is that action going to deliver something valuable? And then that's what ends up defining value for us. Um, and so we've started to do that both 
in the clinical domain. We've also started to do it in the domain of trials matching, trying to, um, as soon as we can, identify um, trials for our patients. Hey, Alex, let me um, sort of extend a little bit of what Rebecca said, because, uh, you know, there, there's been so much about ML and AI in healthcare, but the truth, true use of ML and AI in the clinical aspects of care delivery is, is fairly nascent. It's mm -hmm. quite small. And I think th this actionability component that Rebecca mentioned is one of the key things related to it. And, and that's why I think the space that Mohan and Lean Toss are in, which is more clinical operations, there, there's there's action that you can take related to it. So, if I if I if if Lean Toss can help me figure out how to get more effective utilization out of some surgical robots, so I don't have to go spend another five hundred thousand or a couple million on more robots because every surgeon wants their own, <laughs> but I can have those robots working effectively for our patient population in an efficient manner, that's, that's value to the organization. And I think the other thing that it does is as our clinical operational leaders, which sometimes it is a clinician and sometimes it's an MHA or MBA administrator, as they get more used to understanding what ML and AI can provide in the clinical operation space, the comfort of that translating into utilizing ML in the true clinical decision-making space becomes gets there. Because I think everybody wants to get there. When I talk with clinical leaders at UPMC about this, they all want to use it. But then when you ask them about using ML algorithm at the bedside in an ICU on a given patient, they, they all want to know what goes into the black box and gives spits out the answer. And so I think there has to be this, this growing into the comfort of using it so that you can take action. And I, and I think that, that Lean Toss and, and clinical operations, that's a tool that allows us to edge into that and be comfortable with the decisions that um, an ML solution is making for the patients that we take care of. Both Alex and Rebecca have touched on a very, very important thing, which is actionability. Too often people doing AI and ML try and cover the entire waterfront and assume that if I absorb every snippet of data from every system out there, we can make intelligent decisions. The problem is you have to go vertical, not horizontal. Because mm -hmm. as you try and go horizontal, you just try and siphon too much data and you get lost in the weeds. Watson is a great example of absorbing terabytes of data and then having struggling to make it actionable. So our belief is, you have to go vertical, pick a narrow area and understand the living daylights out of every little detail. How are the chairs configured? How are the pods? Where's the pharmacy? What are the nursing shifts? And when you understand it at that level, how are blocks allocated? Who gets it? Who uses it? Who tends to waste the block that was assigned to them? Only then can you make recommendations that are actionable. And when they act on the recommendation and it delivers good results, it builds confidence. So that's the virtuous cycle you have to create. And it all stems from the key point that both Rebecca and Rob made, which was actionability. So I, I have a quick uh, follow-up on this. There was a, a question um, you know, that we, we got in our Q&A box. And again, I want to encourage people uh, uh, to use this. And I know you've given a brief answer. Um, but there, the, the question was about the challenges in connecting to various distributed data sources to make sure that you have uh, the right data. Um, I, I kind of want to expand on that a little bit for my own question is that there is, as, as any doctor that I've talked to will tell you, a plethora of, of apps, of different systems, of different, you know, uh, data issues. You know, the, the physician might be using Athena Health for patient management, but they're affiliated with a hospital that's using Epic or Cerner. And you know, then uh, their specialists may be using another system entirely to manage their patient records. How do you make sure that you're you know, keeping data consistent even, even through the operability of all of these different systems? And I'll start with you, Mohan, but I saw Rob nodding along, so I feel like he's gonna wanna follow up. Yeah. Um, yes, it is a challenge because the data is disparate. It's across scattered across many systems. And more than just the physical mechanics of getting bits and bytes of data across, the definition of metrics 
uh, can vary from location to location. So two hospitals in the same network may think of utilization differently. So you have to solve it at two levels. At the core level, you've got to get the data extraction pipes. And that's a quite a well understood thing. There are all kinds of companies that build uh, data extraction and data flows. You can get real time feeds. HL7 and FHIR are well understood interfaces for uh, getting data. So the mechanics of getting it are, are well understood. At the meta layer, you have to align on metrics. So the key thing, again, going back to why you need to pick a narrow area and go vertical, is you understand exactly what you're looking for. And you can understand how to extract it, which tables, which fields, and how to interpret it. Then you can build intelligence. Because Rebecca said earlier, garbage data will give you garbage insights. That's, that's exactly right. So you've got to solve at both levels. Rob, Rebecca, you guys are on the other side of this uh, uh, issue on data. I'd love to get your thoughts as well. I'm sure um, I'll add Mohan. Uh, um, so a, a lot of it, Alex, is it is true. Uh, I've got nearly 1,500 different clinical systems here at UPMC. Um, and so data definition and vocabulary is one of the um, important aspects. And it's not just defining it, but defining it for what its use is. So defining data for CMS reporting and quality is frequently very different than how we define data to use in trying to improve the operations, the organization. <clears throat> and we have to make sure that we separate and focus on that. The, the other thing that I think um, I've experienced at other health systems, and it's something we're trying not to recreate here at UPMC is, there's this concept of cre let's create a clinical data warehouse. The, the, those boiling the ocean concepts, they, they tend to actually not be as successful as people vision them. Let's have all the data in one place because people aren't really applying the stringency of the use criteria of the data. And so one of the things we've taken an approach of is we import the data that's specifically related to a use project. So if we're working with Mohan on optimization of an infusion clinic, we work with the data that's specific to the project that's there. We make sure that it's defined in a manner that's useful across our organization. And in that way, we not only have the opportunity of having a successful implementation in one infusion center, we now know we also have a model that we can actually scale to the other infusion centers across the system. And so I think uh, it, it's very important and, and it goes back to how you think about data of use at the beginning of the inception of the project and making sure that everybody agrees on those terms and how it should be used. Yeah, and you know, I think everybody has largely covered it, but I, I will just um, highlight some of the things that have been said. I think one of the big thing has to do with contextualizing the data for what you're trying to use it for, which, which is ultimately what Rob was saying. Um, you know, how you use it, how you interpret it comes down to what you're trying to do with it um, and, you know, how valuable it'll be. So, you know, it comes back to what Mohan was saying about focus. You focus on what problem are you trying to solve? What data do you need to solve it? And how do you contextualize that data to extract the relevant meaning out of it? Um, the other thing we have found because data comes in different forms, um, whether it be structured or unstructured and data by various stakeholders across the institution undergo transformations um, to break it down into more discrete meaning that it's really important to also track data lineage um, as to all the steps in which data has gone through um, to make sure that you haven't lost meaning or um, the meaning hasn't been misrepresented. So as we start to, um, you know, use the data for very, in various different ways, the same data, we also go back and look at the data lineage and how that, that came to be. Um, and that's something we have recently put in place with a new system to make sure um, that we're tracking that for everything that we do and every person who has kind of interacted and touched that data. Great, terrific. Uh, Rebecca, I wanna stick with you because I wanna kind of take uh, this more abstract layer of discussion that you've had and, and, and kind of uh, narrow the focus. Um, and I understand that uh, 
MDA has been working with uh, Lean Toss on a, a beds capacity management system. I wonder if you might be able to kind of talk a, a, about that. Uh, you know, uh, Mohan was talking about, you know, these narrow verticals. So uh, I'd love to hear about how that kind of worked uh, in practice and what you learned from that. Yeah, I mean, this is um, a perfect example of um, where you can plug this kind of technology in and get a real demonstrable result. It's um, defined in a discrete way. Um, and so our problem statement, um, as it were, was that by the middle of the week um, at MD Anderson, our patient census in our hospitals was at 100%. We would just mm. take a peak. Um, or we were essentially log jammed in our hospitals. Um, and this happens repeatedly every week. And the management of um, this is done or was done largely in a lot of meetings, a lot of expert people with you know, a lot of the knowledge in their heads, um, as well as spreadsheets. Um, and so that is not an effective way to manage. And so I think what's important about this is yes, Lean Toss came in and has ultimately helped, helped us flatten out that curve um, by you know, looking at the data and creating both, you know, there's kind of a continuum. It starts at the most simplistic level of creating transparency into the kinds of events that are happening to help us better manage how we're allocating beds um, and how we're sequencing different activities, whether it be um, cleaning of rooms, whether it be discharging, transfers, the whole gamut, all of those things um, impact the, the chain that creates capacity. Um, and if you don't have transparency into those things, right away, it makes it impossible to manage. Um, so it begins by getting the data and creating electronic systems to create that transparency, but that's just, that's just step one. Um, getting more sophisticated, you start to be able to then create insights into the right actions that need to be taken through predicting what's going to happen next. And that's where it gets um, even more interesting. Um, we are in the early stages of that. Um, so I don't have, you know, specific results. What I could say though, is the anecdotally, the teams on the ground, um, are just so enthusiastic about having these tools in place. And mm -hmm. one of the things I want to share is it's not just about having the technology. Um, it's about how you use it. You know, the team came in and helped us really, redesign our operational process along with the utilization of the technology. The two things have to go together. Um, so it becomes a unified experience because if you drop technology into a poor process um, or you haven't mapped out that actionability around that technology, it's not gonna yield any results. Um, so that's something we've done with the Lean Toss team collaboratively, which is to really take a hard look at the way in which we were managing, the way in which we were um, utilizing the small amount of data we had. And then as we introduced more data, more tools, more predictions, um, what does that change in the way in which we operate? And that's what becomes really powerful is the intersection of those two things. Uh, Mohan, I'd love to hear about this uh, from, from your end and what, what was the challenge in uh, kind of coming in, you know, uh, al almost fresh like this to, to work with uh, a large, uh, you know, cancer center like, like MDA? Right. Beds for us is a new area of development. We started building it a little over a year ago and the opportunity is enormous for impact. If you think about it, there are 1 million beds in the United States alone, 1 million hospital beds. And it's the most expensive hotel room in the world, right? It's $1,000 a night. So if you think about it, there's a billion dollars a day in hospital bed allocations. And if you think about how hotels manage this, they have it easy. They kick you out of the room by noon and they don't let you into the room until three. So automatically they've built in the 12 to three window to clean the room, turn the room and make it ready for incoming. Health systems on the other hand are stuck in an unfair deal uh, as far as bed allocation goes, because 
the demand for the bed is early mornings. People come out of surgery at eight and nine and 10 in the morning and they need the bed. Unfortunately, checkouts drag out into the afternoon because you need the lab results, you need the imaging result, you need the physician to uh, give you the final okay, et cetera. So imagine the hotel room where check-in is at noon and check-out is at four instead of the other way around, and you'll understand why the log jam happens. And so every health system, Rebecca talked about the middle of the week being a crunch. That's a universal truth. The middle of the day is also a crunch. 11 and 12 in the morning uh, is when all the incoming is exceeding the, the pace of departures. And so the challenge for health systems is to not commingle high utilization with effective flow. You can have a very high utilization where the beds are 99% occupied, but nobody's moving anywhere, in which case they continue to remain 99% occupied and patients get backed up in the PACU, in the hallways, in the ED. So our goal is to use analytic sophistication to accelerate the discharges, thereby unleashing a capacity increase of beds which then allows patients to flow through more quickly. So this, if you improve this, the stakes are enormous. Access improves, more patients can be treated and seen, wait times improve, the revenues and margins of health systems improve, which is obviously under severe challenge now. Uh, and so we view this as a very important area that touches every facet of healthcare. And that's why we are excited to partner uh, with uh, MD Anderson on, uh, on building this up. Alex, I just want to add one thought to what uh, Mohan said, you know, um, so clinically I'm a pediatric intensivist. So pediatric ICU beds are a tight resource at most healthcare systems. And um, the way reimbursement works for the most part, um, the census drop is at midnight. So it's heads and beds at midnight. And um, you know, many times I feel like I'm functioning and as the intensivist, as a hotel manager in trying to identify patients in the room. And to, to Mohan's point, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., I feel like I'm oversubscribed, more patients than beds. But more frequently than not, that same midnight, I'll end up with four, six, eight, ten, you know, empty beds. So there's this there's this mismatch between what I'm doing during the day and then what happens at midnight when the census drops, which is generates the revenue for the room. And so there's this thing where, where you're trying to balance sort of the what's optimal for the patients to care for as many as possible, but also what is optimal for the organization in trying to create a realistic and appropriate margin in care delivery process. And healthcare is not a business people choose necessarily to go into for making margin, right? It's something mm -hmm. we do. We all have a different passion as to why we're in healthcare, um, but much of, a, much of it has to do with some aspect related to the patients. And so, but trying to have that margin so you can have that mission is very important. And solutions and thought processes like what Mohan expressed and what Rebecca talked about are very important us, in us being able to move into the future and doing that. Uh, I, I want to follow up with you, Rob. I'm, I'm curious in terms of when you're trying to optimize assets, do you run into, you know, bad incentives, whether it's from reimbursement or regulatory or insurance, you know, in terms of like, you know, it'd be optimal to do it this way, but, you know, we, we don't get paid if we do it this way or things like that. No, I mean, um, so being a pediatric intensivist, I've been very, mm -hmm. very fortunate. Um, I've worked in um, four different children's hospitals mm -hmm. across the country and currently here at Children's Hospital Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, I've been in, in a fortunate space where I've been able to deliver care without having to be too concerned or really at all mm -hmm. concerned about the reimbursement or the payer for a given patient. My, my particular um, perspective on that um, is that um, if the administrators of a facility are, uh, have a challenge, so that we should manage that administratively before the patients get to the door of the hospital. But once they're inside mm -hmm. the door of the hospital, then um, you should respect that I'm gonna treat each patient equally. Um, and the UPMC has been fantastic at supporting that in our care delivery process. Um, it sometimes does create some some challenging discussions because at the end of the day we, we do have to be in a um, you know have a reasonable margin so that we can continue the mission of what we're trying to do 
but um, I've been in a fortunate segment of care delivery where at the individual patient level, that has not affected the decision making that I have to make as a clinician. So uh, I want to go back to you, Mohan, because, uh, you know, talking about handling these issues at the administrative level, uh, that's also, I'm sure, where you're working a lot with your customers uh, is at this administrative decision making level. Um, what it, over the past, you know, five, 10 years, as, as AI machine learning options have become more available, we've been able to, you know, solve some of these problems because we've got more computing power. Uh, is, is our administrators catching up? I know healthcare is sometimes notorious for, for not being, you know, early technology adopters. I, I'm curious to know what your experience is uh, right. in this particular case. The thing we always remind ourselves is it's uh, what health system leaders do is incredibly difficult. It's straight up magic when you can operate on someone and then they leave alive. So while it's easy to uh, say, well, they're not rapid adopters of new technology, well, they're right to be cautious. Uh, you don't want to just be experimenting with patient, patients' lives, right? And so what we find is a much more measured and deliberate way of adopting it. Uh, and we find that clinicians are very data driven. So if you put the right data and the right facts in front of them, the debate becomes much more easy than if you just try and assert that this is a better way of doing things. And so we tend to work with the leadership to start with being committed to the data, one source of truth, and using the data to have the difficult conversations. And then slowly to step into the understanding that dashboards and reports are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Just like scoreboards don't win football games, uh, dashboards can't win the clinical game uh, either. So what you need to be able to do is execute excellent plays consistently day in and day out. And that's where we think of uh, adapting health systems to think about AI and ML because in a health system, you've got hundreds of people making dozens of decisions every day, which patient to place in which bed, should we accelerate the discharge, yes or no? These are difficult decisions and they're making dozens of them. If we can inform them with the right facts or the right algorithm to make an intelligent recommendation, which they of course can overrule because at the end of the day, the last mile decision is in the hands of someone with real expertise. You shouldn't try and substitute it, you should augment it. If those decisions get made better, then every day, every play is running a little bit better. And then the scoreboards will reflect the winning game as opposed to relying on the scoreboard at the beginning. Okay. Almost sounds like you could write a book on this. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, which, which in fact, I, I, believe, I believe you did. Um, and I wonder if you wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the, the lessons you've learned that you, you know, have, have applied in that. Uh, yeah, so, so it starts with too many glasses of wine over the holidays. And so uh, the chief operating officer of the company, Sanjeev Agarwal and I, uh, in a you know, holiday spirit said, you know, it would be great if we write a book without understanding exactly how much work it would take. We were signing up for a second job on the side, but we agreed to write it because we felt we had a unique angle on healthcare. Why? Because we'd figured out how to combine operational excellence, data science, scalable software, and healthcare domain knowledge, put all four of them together to build scalable products. These things don't combine naturally. It's a bit like fire and ice because operational expert people tend to not trust computer models. Mm -hmm. Data scientists tend to be theoretical mathematicians who don't have operational judgment as to what happens on a shift change, what happens uh, in turnovers, et cetera. Uh, and software and health systems tends to be infrastructure like software, not mobile web-based uh, kinds of software. So putting all of this together was particularly difficult and we figured out how to do it. We are also blessed in that we work with a hundred leading health systems like UPMC, like MD Anderson uh, and many other leading institutions around the country. We've learned a lot from them because the, the problem is multifaceted, it's very nuanced, it's very detailed. And we managed to incorporate all of those. So we felt it was a good idea to write, write a book, but write it uh, without getting into the nitty gritty of products, write it from a thought leadership perspective. What are our views on supply and demand? 
And so it took us six months of nights and weekends uh, drawing on our whole team to write it. Uh, and uh, we're happy it's done, <laughs> but yeah, it's out there as better healthcare through maps now. Well, well, well great. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of these challenges in, in terms of the uh, operational, you know, thinking versus data science thinking. Uh, I'm curious, I want to, Rebecca, um, are the, has this been a challenge for you in your role as chief innovation officer in, in kind of bridging the gap uh, between these two modes of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I would say that in my role, you know, my role is a little bit of an interesting misconception. When people look at the title, they think, um, wow, that, you know, innovation, you're going to be creating all of these um, new, exciting things, and that must be lots of fun. Um, and it's not to say that it's not fun, but the job is a lot more psychosocial than it is creating new things. The, what technology you should use, selecting the technology, looking at the community of different types of things you can do that will add value, that part's easy. That part is maybe 10% of my time. The hard part is the how do you move an organization that's very large, that has a lot of different constituents, a lot of different personalities, a lot of different agendas, um, forward um, to take the risk to adopt something new to change. And that is the bulk of my time when it comes to innovation, because it's not interesting or valuable if you can't actually move the needle. Are you really innovating if you haven't driven a transformational change, if you haven't driven a, a large amount of value? Well, no, you've done something in the corner that really hasn't done anything. Um, so the trick is how do you move the machine um, a big organization? And that comes down to um, timing. You know, I can see tons of amazing things in the market and think that they're great. In fact, I, you know, could personally say, God, I'd invest money in that. That's fantastic. It may not be the right time for the organization. Um, it may not be aligned with our priorities at that time. So is it going to be aligned with those priorities? And then it's what's on our agenda, the leadership, and really getting the leadership um, to own it. If you're an innovation shop, you can't own it. Um, our stakeholders, our leaders have to own the initiative. Um, it has to be theirs. Um, you are helping to drive it forward. You're helping to make the connections um, you're helping with the navigation and certainly, especially when we work with Mohan and team, you're also looking at, well, where do I take it next? Um, because it might be a different leader that the next interesting development is going to be under. Um, but those leaders ultimately have to buy in. Um, and anyone who's worked in academic medical centers knows that, you know, they are a product of democracy and large amounts of socialization across many different stakeholder groups before decisions can be made. Um, so navigating across that and getting the buy-in and getting the willingness to change becomes the hard part of the job. Rob, uh, I wanted to follow up to, to see if you wanted to chime in with some of your thoughts on this as well. I mean, to, to add a little bit to what Rebecca said, I, you know, the, the word that comes to mind is we're, we're facilitators, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the time, the points when they try and make us own something, it it's, ends up being something that, that doesn't scale frequently. But if we can facilitate the change process and, and one of the, the, you know, a couple of key things, one is, um, is the people have to have that willingness to change. Frequently, the conversation is, we want new technology, but we don't want to change what we do on a daily basis. I'm like, so you want to spend money to do something to make it just like you're doing right now? That's not going to happen, right? And so there has to be this willingness and openness to change. Um, and uh, I probably spend more time talking about people and process than I do about the actual technology because the, the, that's one of the key pieces to scale. 
is people in process and, and being able to do something and, and, and um, getting people to understand and have a willingness because, because um, innovation unto itself um, can be very cool. And it sounds like, Hey, I want to be involved in that. But the truth is, is that there, there's a, there's a change of heart of the actual people who are operating the process that needs to occur. And then that's when you have something very cool because then you get this sort of seamless blend of the technology and the people in their workflow to effectively scale something and become much more efficient and also not just efficient, but much more effective for the patients that we all care for. Um, well, Rob, uh, I want to I want to follow up with this idea um, based on something that you you mentioned earlier uh, in talking about um, AI specifically, uh, which is that you know it can seem like a black box and and people are nervous about it when it comes to treatment decisions, especially, which is why I know that FDA and other regulators are are making you know the explainability of that AI of of paramount importance, and I don't. I don't think FDA would ever approve an AI decision that that you know wasn't explainable. Um, on the operational side, do you see that same level of hesitancy? I, 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 th I think with, that with there's, a, I, I think there's uh, on, more on trust. the operation side, or or is that desire still there? I, I think um, in the operation side, mm -hmm. there's more trust because clinical operations and ML, you're you're applying it to a. a problem that's a system related problem as opposed to a clinical decision mm -hmm. support which may be a, a single patient related problem and because of that i think it's easier to generate that trust and i think i'm hopeful as i, I think mohan and rebecca are that as we generate that trust in ml through clinical operations people will say you know what this can actually do some really good things and allow me to scale better maybe in this clinical decision paradigm, um, identifying patients who might be at risk for sepsis 12 hours sooner than when they actually develop sepsis, where you can actually then take an intervention or an action. I think that that will allow those thought processes to mature a little bit more. Um, and, and to that point, I think that, that part of the skepticism is your physicians are frequently, they're trained to like show your work and the black box makes it really hard to see the work. And that's where some of that challenge in creating trust occurs. Um, and I, I'm curious, um, and uh, let me go to Rebecca on this one, but you know, if anyone else wants to, to chime in, uh, but kind of during uh, the, the pandemic when we've had to really accelerate things like more telehealth or, or different kinds of resource allocations since we don't have elective surgeries. Okay, well, let's use that operating theater for something else. Um, has that helped change the mindset about some of these digital changes? Is there more openness to change and, and accelerating some of these trends that you see coming out of the pandemic? Or, or do you think some of that inertia will slide back? It's, it's, I have strong beliefs on this one. Um, I've actually been starting to study it, which is you know, the pandemic has accelerated things. Um, we've been probably busier than we've ever been. And we've had the ability to get more initiatives off the ground during the pandemic than probably the entire time not in the pandemic. Um, and so necessity um, changes the game. We had, you know, people had to change. There was no choice. It wasn't, well, it would be nice, you know, telehealth, for example. Mm -hmm. We spent years trying to introduce telehealth into the organization with very little um, success, with a lot of resistance, a lot of people talking about how important it is to be face-to-face -face and um, right there with the patient. But when necessity comes, um, you know, people have to change. Um, what's great about that is I think it creates permanent changes, not, not necessarily, I'm questioning whether it'll be in the culture, but certainly in at least the areas we've managed to make movement, meaning now that people are comfortable using uh, telehealth and digital technologies, they're going to continue to be comfortable with that. They got over that initial change hump. And once you're over the hump, you're good and you're willing to do more and more. Um, so I think in those particular spaces, 
we're going to see um, a continuation. The overall mindset of willingness to change, meaning when the next new thing we want to introduce that we didn't introduce during COVID comes, um, I suspect there'll be a slide back um, to kind of the the old ways, the old kind of cold feet. Um, and, you know, I guess what goes along with those cold feet is also the um, putting out the fire in front of you instead of thinking about how to avoid fires in the future. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of organizations spend a lot of time putting out fires instead of, you know, those prevention mechanisms for the future so we don't have fires. And that's the constant argument you make in innovation um, in terms of resource prioritization as people are so focused on the immediate need. And I, I would guess that that, um, that environment will probably slide back. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> if someone has an idea for how to stop that from sliding back, I'm all ears. <laughs> So uh, we have a, another question uh, from the audience, and I think I'll, uh, I'll 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 stick with you, Rebecca, since we were just talking about this. Uh, do you do you see uh, the question is do you see the likes of of Google, Amazon, Microsoft kind of involving themselves more in healthcare analytics business? Is that a trust builder? Does it make people more cautious? Is it really kind of six of one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's an effort. I think these organizations, they are trying to get into the space. They're largely trying to enter as it relates to cloud services, um, that it feels more like the end game um, than what we might associate them with. Um, you know, you see some of them getting into some of the consumer related parts of healthcare, which would be their sweet spot because what these organizations expertise is, is an understanding uh, consumer experience. That's, that's where they've, they have a leg up on probably every healthcare vendor there is, is they understand how to engage consumers, how to design those experiences. Um, but none of them have gone deeply vertical. They still strike me as horizontal companies. Um, which is why it always feels like there's a fallback into your more generic cloud services than truly healthcare specific transformational um, mm -hmm. initiatives, like I said, with maybe the exception on a few consumer based things. Um, and then I think that the other piece that comes up over and over again now is data handling. Um, how are they, how are, what are their provisions around protecting your data, um, you know, not giving, not utilizing it, um, you know, out of school, uh, you know, protecting you from breaches, all of those kinds of things and the, in the kind of um, liability they'd be willing to take on, which is very little. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that also comes into play, or at least when it when we're talking about it, it's probably the first conversation, which is um, having the conversation about data handling. Um, that's oftentimes is a showstopper. Got it. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, Mohan, we've got about one minute left. So I'm going to leave the last question on you, and and that's really just love to know what you see as as kind of the the future role. Of, of digital transformation in, in managing and optimizing these assets? Eventually, capacity management will be dynamic, sophisticated, mobile, accessible anywhere, anytime, right? And it has to continuously improve utilization and provide a better experience. That's the end game. Now, will it take a bunch of bumps and bruises to get there? Sure, it will. But if you think about every other industry that has had to optimize that way, Yield management in airlines has been a science for 30 plus years. Every seat on every flight every day for the next 180 days is priced differently. And they, as the capacity goes, they understand whether to open up more award travel, restrict award travel. Uh, and it's based on if there's a Super Bowl in Tampa, you don't want to sell discounted seats to Tampa. You want full fare flights to Tampa. So they've understood how to price everything. Uh, similarly, you take things like what Open Table has done. It's helped improve restaurants, fill their tables, and made it easier for consumers. What Uber and Lyft have done compared to Yellow Cab uh, has been 
improve the utilization of cars while making it easier to get a ride. So in general, that's where capacity management will head. And in healthcare, we will get there one piece at a time uh, to where eventually it is uh, friction-free and allows for much more volume, right? So if you think about an airport can do 10X the number of flights that it used to handle 20 years ago. Uh, and it's the same airspace and the same number of runways. So what they've managed to do is increase the velocity, which improves the experience and the utilization. And that's kind of what our mission is. Great. Well, well thank you for those thoughts, Mohan. And I want to thank uh, all of the panelists. Uh, this was a really uh, interesting webinar. I think we could have kept going for another hour. Uh, but alas, we have to be adaptable and flexible and move right on into yoga. And uh, thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you to Alex and all of our panelists. If you would like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now, please welcome yoga instructor Emma Poole. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for having me today. Uh, this is about a 15 minute yoga flow. If you just wanna move your body and get a little bit of breath circulating. I know a lot of you have been sitting for a while. So if you're choosing to join me right now, go ahead and just situate your seat. We won't be here too long, I promise. Um, but I wanna find a little bit of centering and grounding into our breath. So in the next moment, whether you're sitting on the floor or on a cushion, just gently let your eyes close if that feels comfortable. And begin to tune in to the sound and sensation of your breath. And you can start by taking some gentle inhales and exhales through the nose. Feeling the temperature, and the texture of the air as it moves through the nose. Visualize your shoulder blades relaxing. And even the muscles of your face, the eyes, the lips, the teeth, just softening. Together, let's take a deep breath in. Open your mouth, exhale. You can send the arms out and up. As you exhale, let a prayer fall into your heart. We'll take that two more times. Inhale, sweep the arms out and up. Exhale, prayer at your heart. Inhaling through the nose, lift the arms out and up. And as you exhale, let your hands just fall right back down to your thighs. Take another inhale here. As you exhale, drop the right ear toward the right shoulder. Notice any stretch that you start to feel in the left side of the neck. Stay as you breathe in. Move your chin toward your chest. And then drop the left ear to the left shoulder. And this side might be more or less tender. Just notice. You're gonna do that again, breathing in. Soften chin to chest. Bring the right ear to the right shoulder. Chin to chest. And left ear to left shoulder. Stay as you breathe in. Stay as you breathe out. Lift your head back up as you reach your arms up, getting a little stretch here through the waist. We'll take a twist to the right. And so you'll tent your right fingertips back behind you. Let that left hand wrap around the front of the right kneecap. As you inhale, feel the body grow a little bit taller. As you exhale, twist. Send your right arm up. Take a side bend. So you're letting that right arm reach up and over the diagonal toward the left and you're dipping 
that left shoulder blade. Good, one more inhale. And then just look over your left shoulder and you're gonna take a twist to your left, so switching sides. Tent the left finger is back behind you. Let the right hand wrap around that left kneecap. As you inhale, feel the rib cage expanding. As you exhale, twist a little deeper. And then send the left arm up. Find that side bend. Let your right shoulder blade dip down and think of creating a little bit more space and a little bit more depth into the whole left side of the body. Good, reach your right arm up to meet your left. And as you exhale, just release your hands. We'll shift off of our seat and come onto all fours. And so you can just take a moment, place your palms underneath you about shoulder distance apart and your knees about hips distance apart. Tuck your toes under and as you inhale, drop the belly, pull your chest forward. Exhale, point your toes, push into the tops of the feet and round your spine. And start to take this on your own. Maybe you're already getting some feedback in the body, especially for those of you that have been sitting all morning, you might feel it in your neck and your shoulders. If it feels good to take some circles or get your hands or your head involved, this is really about exploring what is living in your physical body right now and, and using your breath to create this bridge of awareness. And so just getting a little bit of fluidity, a little bit of mobility in the joints. And in the next couple of breaths, you'll walk your hands forward about a palm's distance, tuck your toes under, and gently press your hips up and back into a downward dog. Downward dog is always a shape that I in would incorporate into my practice if I didn't have a lot of time because it brings the head below the heart, which brings our body into an inversion, which allows blood to flow in the opposite direction. So for those of you that are a little bit tighter here, keep your knees bent. And as you bend your knees, think of pulling your hips higher and pushing the ground away with your hands. So you're just really letting everything drop here. As you inhale, lift your heels and roll out to a plank position, letting your whole spine expand. And as you exhale, soften your knees and come back to your down dog. Looking to the top of your mat, just start to walk your feet forward. You can hang over your legs when you get there, a little bend or a lot of bend in your knees, rocking side to side. Let's catch our opposite elbows, feeling your arms kind of pour into your hands here, as if you're giving the weight of your upper body to the ground underneath it. Feel your brain dropping into the front of the skull. You can take as little or as much momentum as you want here. I'm just noticing what you feel. Right, and the whole purpose of this is to connect and to try to not have judgment around what we're feeling, to just be aware. Take a deeper breath in. Let out a little flutter. <clears throat> Keeping some bend in your knees. Bring yourself all the way up to stand. Reach your arms out and up. And exhale, drop a prayer into your heart. <sighs> bringing your arms by your sides. And you can open your eyes, just relax the muscles of your face. And as you inhale, lift your heels up, rock forward onto your toes. And as you exhale, lower your heels and try to lift your toes, just finding more awareness of your feet. One more time, inhale, lift the heels up. And exhale, lower them back down, try to lift the toes. And then you can release your feet back down. Inhale, sweep those arms out and up. Exhale, dive forward, hinging at your waist, dropping your head. Bring your hands onto the fronts of the shins. Come into a flat back and push your hands against your shins so that you're creating more length here. As you exhale, fold a little bit deeper. Inhale, take it all the way back out and up. Stay here. Catch a hold of your right wrist with your left hand, right wrist with left hand. And as you exhale, begin to side stretch your body toward the left. 
Think of rooting down into the outer blade of that right foot to create opposition. The inhale expands a little bit more and the exhale brings you further into it. Lift back up, catch your left wrist. And as you exhale, begin to draw that left arm up and over to the right. right and this time you're, you're widening through the left side of the body and you're pressing into the outer left foot. Inhale, lift the arms as you exhale, bend your elbows and cactus your arms. And just notice that opening in the shoulders here. Begin to extend your hands behind you. And if you can, if you can have the flexibility, interlace your fingers and start to draw the fist of your hands down the tailbone tip. And so it really feels like you're creating a stretch here across the front of the chest. You can lean back a little bit, brightening up. Bend your knees a whole bunch as you exhale and begin to fold right back down over your legs. And again, letting your head go and just breathing into the feedback of the stretch. Full breath in, release your hands on a breath out. Lift your chest flat back and step back, downward facing dog to lift the hips. As you inhale, lengthen out to your plank pose. And we'll take the knees wide, a little wider than the hips and sit back to child's pose, which is a very grounding posture. And just letting the whole physical body relax here. Breathing into your hip creases, the back of the heart, the top of the head. Letting yourself be completely held by the ground underneath you. Take one more deep breath. And then exhale. Slowly roll up to sit. And you'll just swing your legs out from underneath you. And I'll, I'll face you so that you can see. You'll bring your feet into this butterfly shape. So the soles of the feet will come together. The knees will stay open. And I would say have your feet about a foot to a foot and a half away uh, from the groin. And then you'll take your hands, wrap them around the fronts of your ankles. And as you inhale, just try to sit up a little bit taller, like you're pulling your heart forward. As you exhale, round your spine, shift your body weight back and bring chin to chest. Inhale, arching your spine like you're diving your heart forward, rolling shoulders back. And exhale, rounding. <laughs> Good, as you inhale and sit back up, interlace your hands right in front of your heart. Exhale, turn the hands inside out, reach the arms forward and up toward the ceiling. So you're pushing the insides of the palms up toward ceiling, but then you're wrapping the shoulder blades down and back. Close your eyes. Right? And of course, only close your eyes if you feel comfortable, but I find that turning off that external sense can help us to cultivate a little bit more awareness of what's going on inside. Take one more breath here. Find a little side bend to the right. Bring it back to center. Side bend to the left back to center and then as you exhale release your arms fully and hopefully it will feel good to just allow the upper body to begin to fall over the legs and try not to force it let your body simply land where it lands even if that's staying more upright and just allowing your head to drop down if you're pretty deeply in the forward fold, you might turn your palms face up as a gesture of receding. Work to relax the muscles in your mouth, your jaw, your forehead, letting everything just soften down and in. A couple more deep breaths here. Moving very slowly, you'll roll back up to sit. 
you can find that cross-legged seat again. We'll bring our hands together right at the heart. And tune in to the sound of your heartbeat, the, the resonance of that feeling in your chest. And just knowing that yoga is ultimately about deepening our awareness of self, feeling our breath move through our body, feeling our lungs breathe, knowing that we can always take a moment to pause and to become aware of that. I'll chant one sound of Om. You are welcome to join me if you wish. Thank you all so much. Namaste.